Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to episode 64 of Lab Padres, SpaceX, and Starbase Weekly Updates. Things are really happening fast around here, so let's dig in. Beginning this week's update at the build site, Ship 29 stacking continued in the high bay with just the lowermost sections for the bottom dome and engine skirt left to finish the hull. Over at the launch site, rebar cages were lowered into the holes prepared for reinforced concrete friction piles. These piles should help anchor and stabilize the groundworks at the site. New Raptor Quick Disconnect hardware used to start the outer ring of engines on Super Heavy was also installed in the launch mount, swapping out hardware that may be obsolete or possibly damaged after the booster's debut flight. Arrays of high-pressure storage canisters were delivered to the launch site. These types of cylinders are often used to store gases and in this case will store high-pressure nitrogen to drive the water deluge system. Early on Saturday morning, Super Heavy Booster 11's methane tank was fully stacked in the Mega Bay. Once fully assembled, the next phase of production adds adjacent subsystems such as the grid fins. On Sunday, the ship quick disconnect, which supplies propellants, power, and data connections to Starship, was removed from the orbital launch integration tower. Time will tell if it will be refurbished or replaced with an updated design. The booster quick disconnect housing took a significant beating during launch, and repairs are underway. The rear cover of the housing was removed to give access to the propellant lines. Once the housing was out of the way, the flexible segments of the main propellant lines, which may have been damaged during the launch, were removed from the quick disconnect panel. A new launch tower elevator was delivered to the launch site on Monday. This elevator replaces the one that was damaged when the cable supporting its counterweight failed back in early April. Two more friction piles had their rebar cages picked up and lowered into place using the Grove 7550's extended boom to lower the 100-foot-long cages into the board piling holes. In the evening, structural test article S26.1 was cryotested at the Massey site. The tank would be subjected to another cryotest later in the week. On Tuesday, the launch mount work platform was relocated to the staging area outside the payload processing facility. The first boom section and main crane body for the LR-11000 were delivered in the morning. Once assembled, this crane will be used to stack the finished high bay modules together. Back at the launch site, the booster quick disconnect was retracted as workers added scaffolding to the top of the launch mount. Inside the mega bay, workers began installing the grid fins into Booster 11's inner stage ring. At the current pace of construction, Booster 11 should be ready to fly by the end of the year. On Wednesday, crews unloaded the pivot of the LR-11000 and began assembly of the crane's lower sections. After a short stay at the payload processing facility staging area, the booster transport stand was rolled back into the build site and brought inside the mega bay. A Starlink V2 dispenser was installed into a Starship payload section outside the low bay. This section might be destined for ship 32 or 33. With construction operations continuing to speed up, a new LTR-1100 crane was delivered to the launch site. Rolling in on a Grove crane, the first aft flap for the recently assembled Starship 28 was installed inside High Bay. Additional equipment was brought to the launch site that evening, including counterweights for the LTR-1100 crane and a quartet of ride-on power trowels for concrete finishing. A novel single ring with a number of arch-shaped cutouts was placed near the mid-bay. The purpose of these cutouts, which appeared to wrap around the entire ring, is not yet known. We at Lab Padre would like to give a special thanks to our friends at RGV Aerial Photography for graciously sharing these images from their May 20th flyover. Looking at the orbital launch mount, we can see the extensive groundworks that are underway. Multiple holes have been bored into the ground, which have a rebar cage and concrete poured into them once they've been dug. In the center of the table, the ground drill can be seen working while sitting on cribbing over the softer ground. Once the holes are drilled, they quickly fill with water due to the shallow water table in Boca Chica. A large number of Starship and Super Heavy components have been staged for assembly at the ring yard. 
Inside the mid-bay, a possible prototype of the human landing system's side-mounted descent engine section can be seen. Over Flying Massey's test site facing south, several new projects are underway. Work on the foundations for a booster testing station is underway next to the existing Starship test stand. Meanwhile, the short length of the concrete road is being extended, gradually replacing the existing dirt road between the site and Highway 4. Remnants of the flight termination system test article can be seen at the south end of the site. Overlooking the build site as a whole, the scope of the construction work becomes apparent. Large sections of the concrete have been reworked over recent weeks, leveling out the ground and making it easier to move vehicle parts into the bays. The second phase of Star Factory, the heavy metal building, continues to take shape with a large foundation pit being dug, likely for stamping equipment. Older structures and equipment are being cleared out to make way for new, permanent structures, including the ground fabrication building, which began demolition on the 26th. The triangular low bay is slated for demolition in the near future. A number of construction projects are underway at the launch site as well. Behind the launch tower, the compressed gas cylinders are being installed behind the water storage tanks, where they are expected to supply head pressure to the tanks to drive the water deluge system. Looking towards Highway 4, the smaller structures near the Starhopper have been demolished. Next to the horizontal propellant storage tank farm, foundation work is underway for several new commodity storage tanks, which are expected to replace the large vertical tanks that were damaged during Super Heavy's debut launch. This week at Cape Canaveral, Falcon 9 launched Starlink Group 6-3 early on Friday morning, lofting 22 next-generation V2 satellites into high-inclination orbit. In the evening, SpaceX support ship Bob towed just read the instructions out to sea in support of the Arabsat 7B mission. The new Falcon 9 Booster 1080 conducted a static fire test ahead of the Axiom AX-2 mission that evening, assuring that the vehicle would be ready for its debut flight. On Saturday, Falcon 9 Booster 1067 was laid into the transporter to be rolled back to Roberts Road after successfully completing its 11th flight. About four hours ahead of launch, the Axiom AX-2 astronauts headed to LC-39A ahead of their afternoon flight to the International Space Station. Marking the beginning of the third-ever private crewed space flight of Falcon 9 and Dragon, Axiom Space AX-2 and its crew of four successfully lifted off from LC-39A for a one-week stay at the space station. After lofting the second stage and crew into space, Falcon 9 Booster 1080 made its return to landing Zone 1 using a three-engine landing burn to save fuel. The first Vulcan rocket was rolled out to SLC-41 for a flight readiness test fire of the first stage BE-4 engines, but the first attempt was ultimately scrubbed. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week and thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.